Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the I Like Birds podcast. This is actually a very special podcast that we're doing today. It's part two with my friend Charlie Owens here. He had an incredible episode, one of our best ever. He actually went viral on TikTok. He had over 1.5 million views in less than a month, and people from all over the world have been really drawn into his story, and I'm so excited to bring him back for part two because this man is a walking Bible and has so much more to give to people, and I'm so excited excited about it. But before we get into our interview with Charlie, I want to go ahead and share this amazing place that we're in right now. We're in Fort Worth, Texas at the Launchbox Collective. It is an amazing studio spot. You can get anywhere from uh, multi multiple studios. I'm telling you, there are so many places you can go here to be able to record something, to be creative. I love the event spaces. And not only that, you have David and Jen, who are incredible people who are kingdom first. All right. That's the biggest thing I got to say. Kingdom them first their hearts are always in the right place and they give you consultations to be able to set up this incredible set that you see right here me and david have been working hard on it all day so big big shout out to them sponsoring this episode and just making sure that we're set we're set up for a uh, a spirit of success and excellence today so i just want to give some love to them if you're in the dfw come show some love come check it out come give a tour uh and just see what what it's all about for yourself all right so super exciting about that thank you again dave for the opportunity to be here today this is our we're doing one banger a month in this spot, which is going to be something so exciting that I get to share with my people and uh, we'll be able to just honor God in a really big way uh, by doing this uh, monthly spot. So we're really blessed by that. So, Charlie, how you doing, brother? I'm blessed and highly flavored. Hey, every day is a good day when you're Not you just God. flavored, but flavored. Hey, okay. Say so you're supposed to be the salt of the earth, mm -hmm. but the Bible has more than salt in it. Mm, so you on. need to be flavored. Hey, all right. Now, when the last podcast went out, I had one lady in my own home church that viewed the podcast and she went to church with me every week. And she said, I didn't even know your house burned down. <laughs> she actually commented on our video that too. She's like, I've been going to church with Charlie for a long time and I had no idea. And they just didn't know because God took care of all that, as you know, from the last podcast. So, you know, I didn't go out around the church. Oh, boo hoo poor me. I was saying, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. blessings were coming and even today <clears throat> blessings still come in the least uh obvious ways sometimes mm. you just never know where god's going to provide stuff from absolutely that that works out real well uh, i went to a church this past sunday night for a uh, ministry fellowship and i don't normally go to that church but uh, they found out i was in prison ministry and i picked up two new volunteers sunday just from being there at that service wow and that's so needed in the prison right now, isn't it? Volunteers to come in to minister in the prison are always needed. Always. Always needed. Yeah. Because as we have some that drop out, some that come on in, and it's an experience all its own. And unless you actually go in and experience it, it's really hard to describe. And I think you would agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe you have something to say about that. Yep. Me and Charlie actually went this past Saturday. We went to Bridge. Port. Bridgeport. Bridgeport. Yeah, it was about an hour and a half away from my hometown of Alvarado. And uh, we drove out there, had a great car trip. I feel like we had some life giving conversations and got to hear more of this man's incredible stories and knowledge of the word. And, and then boom, the gates were open. And I was like, wow, is this a school? No, it's not a school, <laughs> Zach. When you, when you stepped in that hallway with me, after we cleared the security, and you went through what I call airport number two, yeah, because it's similar to airport security, except a little more intense. Uh, once you clear that and you go down and that door opens and you go through the first chamber and it closes behind you, you go through that second door. Oh, it gets real. And you step out into that hallway. Mm -hmm. What was your first impression when you looked down both directions? Uh, I ain't got nowhere to go. I ain't got nowhere to escape to. <laughs> you, you asked me <laughs> if it was a school because you said this place looks like a school. Yeah, it really did. And that's that's that says something about our school system, don't it? Well, <laughs> yes and no. Uh, I think if our school system would do a better job, uh, we wouldn't have so much to do in the prisons. Exactly. That's but since our country took prayer and the Bible out of the schools, I find it very amazing to me that you can't you have trouble getting the Bible back into schools. But I could take the Bible into the prison. That's interesting. Isn't it? Now, what do you say about that part of it? But mm -hmm. we'd take it into the prisons. Yeah, we did. And it was it was a beautiful experience. 
Um, and I got to see firsthand, it was interesting because you have one expectation of how it's going to be. And um, one would say you'd be a little bit fearful, but honestly, I had the peace of the Lord on me, man. It was really great. It was, it was something that I felt very like, wow, God is blessing me with this and not giving me any spirits of fear, but just a sound mind that like he, he called me to this. He's going to bless it. And then I also saw like right when I walked in, how friendly they were. They came right up to you like, Brother Charlie, like good to see you. And then shook my hand. Thanks for coming. And you got to see in that moment, it went from like in your head of kind of like, potentially oh there could be you know monsters here to just no they're just human beings well, they're, they're just people that need christ they're just, just like people I do. that made mistakes that wound up in prison they just got caught uh -huh. <laughs> there's many of them that's still out here on the street now zach that did such things themselves and haven't got caught yet <laughs> exactly dude. you know uh i i get tickled at the religious people that read that long list of sins in in uh, corinthians and in other locations in the bible and it lists all them long sins. And then I like what the Apostle Paul said, because he said, and such were some of you. Yeah, he, he, he leans in, <laughs> you know, just, he leaned just so in you don't that. think, you know. You know, Paul, he, a real one. He, he was the right choice, in, in my opinion, for ministering to the Gentiles with all the things that the Jews brought up behind him mm. in objections to going to the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, the elite of the elite, a member of the Sanhedrin, he was top dog in in the Hebrew society. Yeah, a Jewish scholar, right? He was a Jewish scholar, yeah. and and you're gonna call him to go to the Gentiles. Now Peter was supposed to go mm -hmm. when he was sent to Cornelius's house, but Peter didn't go to the Gentiles after that. He stayed with the Jewish people in Jerusalem. Wow! But the Apostle Paul went out, and because of him, we have 13 books of the Bible. That's right. And uh, one of the things that I get tickled at is I like asking people, what's the only book of the Bible that's not finished yet? Acts. The Acts of the Apostles. You're right. It's still being written because we're all part of it. Yep, we're the living church. We're the living part of that book that is being continued every day in our lives and what is going on with the Holy Spirit, with God moving in people's lives today. Mm -hmm. That book is still being written and recorded in heaven. Ooh, come on. So when you think about uh, what is the ministry like today? What are we really supposed to be doing? That's right. Uh, if the churches would get up and do what they're supposed to be doing, Amen. instead of what they think they're doing, uh, get away from the almighty dollar and stop worshiping that yeah. and start worshiping God again, uh, God would provide the funds apart from their efforts and would uh, work in the ministry to change lives. That's right. But the biggest problem I see today is the average church out here on the street, and that's what I tell the inmates, with the service you saw and experienced that Saturday night, they're going to be hard-pressed to come out here on the street and find a church that has that kind of service. Would you agree? I would agree. It was a powerful preaching, first and foremost, by Miss Roseanne, who is a firecracker. Oh, now oh. you talk about a New Yorker. <laughs> New Yorker. That is a firecracker. <laughs> first off, she's got that Bostonian New Yorker accent from new jersey mm -hmm. so you have to really listen close sometimes to understand her but man she was uh connecting with each inmate directly which i really appreciated that it was like so loving because she would go right up to them and just preach the word and just bring them into what she was talking about and include them into everything and she wasn't afraid to leave the pulpit you know she oh, was no. she was out in the rows she was in the pews she's you know? all among the chairs yeah it was very beautiful to see and i was i was thinking to myself as a minister of the word myself and as somebody who feels called to be a pastor by the Lord, uh, I felt very like, you know, I need to like, you know, spread my wings and feel comfortable doing that because it has a powerful effect of connecting with people in a real sense of like, wow, she's talking to me. This is God talking to me through her. And the next thing you know, you're, you're able to see the prisoners be so drawn in by that, oh, that yeah. to the point where it was like, it was so real and raw that it, it felt like the, it was just the power of God in the room through her preaching. Yes, the Holy Spirit is very powerful in what she had to say. You could feel, you could feel the presence of God in that room. Yeah, it was thick. And the message that she brought uh, is just right down to earth with what they need to hear. That's right. Uh, if you knew that woman's testimony, mm. and I can share a little bit about what her background is. Mm. Uh, she's a year older than I am, and I'm fixing to be 69. She's got a birthday coming up. She's turning 70. But she was a drug addict and a gang leader in the in the New York area. Wow. 
You know, she was the honcho that gave the orders, and then God changed her life. And just as she served the devil, because she was involved in uh, some very evil stuff, mm. just as much as she served that side, she came full turn to serve this side. And you saw evidence I did. of that. I got to see uh, it first you, and you, you can't deny that the power of the Spirit is in that woman's life. Oh, no. It's and uh, she's just all out yeah. for what she's doing. And she brings people in on what she's doing, too. It wasn't just her trying to take up the the opportunity of like, you know, preaching. She included everybody that came out to do the prison mission to either yes. pray, share a testimony, to pray over somebody, to give counsel. Like she was, she was all in. She was sh showing love to Charlie, you know, letting him share some stuff. You know, it was really mm -hmm. cool to see that because she was leading well, in a really She's the director of the Freedom Gate Prison Ministry. Mm -hmm. She's our director. Yeah. And I go in under her umbrella, under her ministry uh, on that Saturday nights. Uh, in fact, I wanted to talk about how the increase of the ministry is going to be blossoming uh, coming up in February because from the podcast that I did, uh, <laughs> I was prophesied over by a minister that the ministry was fixing to grow. Charlie Owens' ministry? No, God's ministry. Okay. It's not mine. It's God's. Hey, there you go. All right. The one he, the one he gave the you. The one he's got me doing. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> anyway, uh, we had the volunteer banquet at the uh, Bridgeport unit where all the volunteers came in for a banquet for uh, the end of the year. And there was a man there that I've known for about 20 years that's the North Texas Regional Director for a ministry. Okay. And that is Bridges to Life. Gotcha. Well, he asked me about going in with them. And I did the training with their ministry Thursday of last week. And I uh, was told today that uh, I'll be going in on Mondays in uh, the state jail in Jacksboro. Wow. And I'll be going in to the unit you went with me to on Wednesday nights uh, doing the uh, uh, recovery class. It's the uh, restorative justice class wow, that I'll be that. doing uh, with them on that unit. On top of that at the banquet... The chaplain at the Bridgeport unit has asked me if I would be willing to come in and teach one of the classes that I myself took when I was an inmate, which is either the Voyager class or the Overcomer class. And he wants somebody to teach that class that has been through the class mm. because they know what the material is and know how it affects your life. So uh, the advantage to that is going to be one thing, Zach. The inmate that takes that class because it's a required class to make parole is I don't see how this class is going to help at all. That's one of the things they try to say. I just don't see the purpose of doing all this. Well, they could tell most people that, but they can't tell me that. Yeah. You're the living, you're the living fruit of that. You're the living testimony of that because I took that class. Yeah. And look where you are now. And I've been home 20 years now. Hey, two decades strong. I've been home two decades. You can vote now. <laughs> I've been voting for the last four years. What are you talking about? <laughs> Let's go. And I'm going to exercise my vote. There we go. Uh, in fact, I, I, uh, I had occasion to meet a man running for Congress uh, Thursday of last week. I won't say who he was. Uh, you can look at the ballots to figure that out. He's running for Congress. But uh, I asked him a very pointed question pertaining to judicial reforms. I asked him, I said, having been a prior DA... Uh, how many cases do you think are bought and sold in the back room of the courtrooms? What do you say? I was very surprised. He gave me an honest answer. He said about that, 98%. Jeez. Now, what do you think about that fact? I think He we, said that there's no way that they could carry every case on the merits of the cases. They have to do the plea bargainings to clear the dockets. Got to turn and burn, right? Yes, but is that a fair system? No. Absolutely not. But with Absolutely the, not. The amount of crime rate we have here, though, it's almost like, is there a better way? Does that just mean more people, more tax dollars paying for those resources? Well, that tells me that the worldly system doesn't work. Mm. You have there to go, go with a godly system. All right. So how would we how would we lean into godly principles and values and kingdom to be able to okay. restore? We need to teach kingdom principles on the outside. Yes. To keep them from going to the inside. The schools. So we need to school them. Yes. Not just in the school, but in the homes. Yeah. 
because it starts at home, people. It starts at home. Yes, fathers. The Bible says to train up a child in the way they shall go. And when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Whose responsibility is that to train up the child? The parent. Amen. But the problem is, is who trained the parent? That's where, yeah, that's where the, it gets messy water. Somewhere along the line, we've got to break that chain. Yep. Somewhere along the line, we've got to bring that into play to where the Word of God, again, becomes preeminent in all we do in teaching our families and teaching our children what to live by. Because a worldly standard is not godly standard. Absolutely. But uh, they tell me that you're just one of them old fogey religionists. No, I'm not a religionist. Religion will kill you. That's right. I, I'm, I'm not a religionist. I am a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And him alone is the way. Amen. You know, they say that all roads lead to heaven. Well, I would agree they might all lead there. The question is, do you get to stay there? <laughs> Leads you to the throne seat. <laughs> well, they lead there, but there's two judgments up there according to the Bible. Yeah. One of them is the great white throne, the other one is the seat of Christ. Now, which one did you want to be at? Because <laughs> one of them leads to destruction, and the Bible says broad is the way and wide is the gate. It leads there, and many be entering into it. Yeah. Amen. But narrow is the way and straight is the gate that leads to eternal life. The Bible said few there be that find it. You've got to really search to find that. Yeah. And I know in your own life, you're searching for that. You're still a young man. Yes, sir. You've got a long road ahead of you. Yes. But I can see God moving in your life because you've got that hunger. You've got that desire. Thank you. Uh, the conversation we had uh, going up to Bridgeport and back on our drive up and back, uh, you gained quite a few pointers on ministry from your experience up there. Yeah. What did you, what'd you learn from that? Uh, number one, compassion. I felt that um, I thought I had compassion. And then I went there and then my compassion was elevated to a new level because you have a, um, I'll just be real. You have kind of a hatred for somebody that could ever hurt a child, you know, and mm -hmm. can ever hurt, um, you know, hurt, hurt somebody else. You have this like, you know, I could never do that. But also I didn't realize that it, it a lot of it, majority of it stems from. Uh, the person that did that to somebody else had that happen to them. So it was, it's a vicious cycle of sin that has um, and trauma that just has an effect to the point where it's like the abuser becomes the one that abuses. So that that really, you know, especially in our car ride, I felt like we really hashed out uh, what that means and what that looks like, mm -hmm. as well as just hearing stories that you shared from mm -hmm. from your own walk, as well as with other inmates and stuff. And just how um, in, in the prison, you also shared that if you are somebody that is a sexual abuser, um, you are hated in there and, you're, and your uh, violence comes your way and you can never really share that what you actually did. So therefore, if you're never able to really confess what you did, um, to people, how are you going to be able to confess it to the Lord and be renewed in that, you know? Well, any offense that you go to prison for, this is what I really find amazing, is even the prisoners themselves category uh, offenses high, low, and in between. Yeah. But sin is sin. Sin is sin. And it don't matter whether it's a big offense, little offense. Uh, the parole board loves to set people off their first time up for parole for nature and seriousness of offense. Now, you don't go to prison for doing misdemeanors. That's true. You go to prison for felonies. So every single offense that goes to prison is a serious offense. So that's just a cop-out to set you off the first time. Mm. Now, the inmates in there, they, they want to rank the uh, categories based on three things. Number one, their gang status. Uh, the more violent they are, the more macho they become, and they build their reputation on that. The only problem is, is if you go into a prison and you join a prison gang, you're in that gang for life even when you get out because that travel card goes to your prison record, goes to the police record, and will follow you for the rest of your days that you were involved in a gang member, and that's going to follow you forever. So if you join the gang... Be careful. Uh, I myself, as an inmate, when I went to prison, I was told by the Aryan Brotherhood, the white supremacist group, that if I did not ride with them, that I would probably die in prison. Wow. And I told them, I came alone, I'm going home alone. My God will protect me. 
and I didn't join no gangs the whole time I was there. Hmm. But I've seen a lot of violence in prison in my life. I've seen a lot of ministry in prison in my life. Uh, during the years that I was incarcerated, I got to go to Bible college three years and seminary four years while incarcerated. Wow. Uh, I had a scholarship at 18 years old. Uh, I went to Springfield, Missouri to view the college and uh, check it out. And at the altar call that night at 18 years old, I remember telling God, God, I'll serve you, but I put a condition on it. My dad frequented uh, the local taverns quite often. He wasn't really a drunkard, but he just never seemed to be there for me sometimes. And I remember praying a prayer, Lord, either get him out of there to be my dad or just take him on home. That's what I prayed. I didn't think about the consequences of that prayer. I came home that night from the visit to Springfield, Missouri, and I called home for my dad to come pick me up, and my mom said, son, your dad died this morning. Now, that was a shock in my life. That was one of the great shocks. And because of that, I rebelled against God. I rebelled against society. I rebelled against everything I knew that was right. I was angry, and I acted in anger. I asked, acted in frustration, and I went out and did things that I'm not proud of doing. But I look back at those years in my life, and I see where the root cause of it was, was my anger and being mad at God. Hmm. But God saved my life by sparing me, by sending me to prison. Because if I'd stayed on the street, I'd probably died. What did he do for you when you were in prison? The first prison sentence I did, he got me straight back into the Word. I came home knowing who I was in Christ, and I sought to serve God. The only problem was is I still had not gone to Bible college yet. <laughs> now, I had made the vow that I'd go. Now, people, I'll tell you now, if you make a vow to God, be careful what you vow to God. Because Ecclesiastes 5 says to keep your footing when you go before God, not to utter just anything before him. Don't say to the angel in that day that it was an error that you made the vow. Pay that which you have vowed. For it is better that you had not made the vow at all than to make the vow and not keep it. Because then God will become angry at the words of your mouth that causes your flesh to sin. And then he will destroy the works of your hands. Wow. Now, because I did not fulfill that vow, every single thing that I touched as far as employment, jobs, and everything else, came to nothing. It was always something. Everything I touched came to nothing. Ten years to the day, I got out in 1982. In 1992, I was accused of offense and went back to court. Ten years, time. You were out for ten years? I was out for ten years. Wow. And I sought to serve God during that time. Mm -hmm. The only problem is I wasn't doing what God told me to do. Because you weren't going to Bible college. I had not gone, got the schooling. I had not gone, done what he told me to do. I did not fulfill the vow that I had made. And because of that, everything I touched fell apart. Wow. Now, when I went to court and I fought the case because I was innocent of this case, but the evidence against me found me guilty, therefore it stands because the conviction rate stands. The court record is what they go by, is not what you go by. They don't even go by the facts anymore. But I was kind of bitter when I went in the second time trying to figure out what deja vu was. And I was talking to the chaplain right after I got down there, and I was telling him about the opportunity that I'd missed and how I felt like I just ruined my life and that it was too late now. A lot of inmates, Zach, feel like it's too late. Hmm. Even out here on the street, there's people that feel like they've done too much. It's too late. Yeah, they're too dirty to get in the water. It's too late for God to do yeah. anything. It's never too late. 
God is a God of second, third, and fourth chances. That's right. God will make a way if you call out to him. No matter how low you reach, God can reach you. Wow. When I told the chaplain I felt like I'd wasted all that, and I told him about the lost scholarship that I could have had at 18, he said, you really wanted to do that, didn't you? I said, well, yeah, but it's kind of too late now. I'm sitting here for a 30 year sentence. What am I going to do with it? He said, wait outside for a minute. He called me back into the office and he said, uh, you have a full scholarship for three years of Bible college and four years of seminary fully paid for it. Do you want it? He made one phone call. He made one phone call. <sighs> and I said, you're not kidding. He says, no. Do you want it? I said, of course I want it. Wow. Now, during those years of study, many things happened, and I can give you one that I really remember how God used that in the prison. Now, I was on a dormitory at that time with 120 inmates, big, huge, open dorm, upstairs and downstairs. I'm in a lower bunk, and uh, inside the prison, you use your mattress to sit on, use the bunk as a desk. Okay. Okay, so I've got my books out on the bunk. I'm working on my lessons. And in order to go to chow, to go eat, you've got to put everything up, make the bed, put everything back in the locker, leave everything straight, then go eat, then pull it all back out again. And I didn't want to interrupt my thoughts of where I was in my studies. So I said, no, I'll just skip. So I didn't go to uh, breakfast that morning. I didn't go to lunch that day, and I didn't go to supper that night. The boy is fasting. I'm, he, he, he I'm, know I'm, I'm busy trying to learn <laughs> a particular lesson I was involved in reading and studying and looking at. What I didn't know, Zach, was a non-believer, was not a Christian man, lived across the dorm from me upstairs. Sitting on his bunk, he could look across the dorm and see right straight down into my bunk. And he'd been watching me all day long. Now, Zach, I've seen a man get stabbed in prison over a 25-cent ramen noodle soup. I mean, ramen's pretty fire. Well, <laughs> you just don't give those away. They're like gold in there. They're going out here too, boy. <laughs> he, he, came, he came over to my bunk with his bowl with a ramen soup already made in it. Oh, that's sweet. And asked me what I was doing, and I said, I'm doing my Bible studies for Bible college. He said, well, you haven't ate anything all day. I said, I know. He said, well, you need to eat something. Here, I made you a soup. That's kind. That's where I got introduced to him. And then that started with him bringing it to my cubicle for me to eat that one bowl of soup. After that, I began going out into the day room with some of my studies at one of the tables with him answering him questions about the lesson I was studying, and he became a Christian. Wow. That is so cool. But you never know how that's going to work in your life, yeah. of who you're going to affect, when it's going to affect you. So as I am involved now, 20 years home, I look back at the years of ministry before I ever got out. It didn't start when I came home. It started way before that. That's right. He, it's just a continuation yeah. when I came home. Yeah, he uses you in so many different ways. I was actually just telling Dave uh, before we we're setting up the set and everything. Uh, I did a show in Oklahoma, and um, I, I was able to do like a 20-minute, 25-minute uh, preaching set on Sunday. And then I was able to do like a comedy slash testimony show on that mm -hmm. Saturday. And uh, it went well, like it was it was well received. People were buying books and showing love and supporting the ministry. And this one kid actually he was a teenager named Ben. He actually added me on Instagram and I was like, all right, cool. Like, you know, having him keeping connections with him. And uh, he actually sent me a message yesterday uh, in the morning saying that he got baptized. Wow. This previous weekend. And nice. he said I had a lot to do with it from coming to the show and uh, sharing my testimony and stuff. And it was just so cool because that was my first like travel event. Um, of the year and to just see God was moving through that even through like a comedy show slash testimony mm -hmm. show it was just powerful you you never know how God will use an individual that's right but we all have testimonies we do 
And each individual testimony is for a reason. Yes. Because I can't reach everyone. That's right. But I have a specific testimony that reaches those people. Because when society says, I just can't stand those people. Well, people, I'm one of those people. <laughs> What's your slogan at your church say? Where the unwanted Oh, are, down there in, at, where I go to church, the yeah. full gospel tabernacle. Our marquee out front says where the unwanted are welcomed. That's right. So all them people you other churches <laughs> throw away that run off and kick to the curb, we take them in. There we go. And we minister to them down there. That's and so uh, it's such a blessing to see what God is doing in so many of their lives. Wow. Because uh, if, if the church is not ministering to the people and you've got to have a $300 suit on to get in the door, and you don't smell right, you don't look right, you don't dress right. You don't tithe right. Uh, you ain't going to be making it very good in heaven because uh, your apparel ain't going to be what gets you in there. That's facts. That's fact, because we're all going to be wearing white robes. Hey, let's go. Now, I don't know how many people out there know this, but on 90% of the prison units in the state of Texas, the inmates wear white. Oh, I didn't know that. White pants and white shirts. So I tease them on those units that they're already halfway to heaven because they're already dressed in white. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> it is a good one. Now, uh we were talking before the broadcast, Zach, about how do you get the message across to inmates mm. about what Christ has done? And we were talking about you, you were impressed that I knew not only about the crucifixion, but I knew the thief's name. But I also know some things about the one that got set free. Yeah, Dismas is the prisoner that said, remember me. On the cross. On the, the cross. Yeah, the, the. But we are, all know from Scripture that Barabbas is the one that they released. That's right. Now, what they don't know is in studying the Hebrew language, when you go back to the original languages, and this is why I emphasize that, you learn things from the language that you don't get from the English. It's them gold nuggets I told you about on mm -hmm. the last broadcast. The name Barabbas is bar Abbas. Bar means son of the father. Barabbas, Abba. His father, Barabbas, is son of the father. God, son, is Jesus Christ. So you had the son of the father and God's son being presented. To Pilate. To Pilate. And Pilate presents them to the people. And the people are chanting, let go of Barabbas. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament, to the sacrificial sacrifice of atonement, you have the scapegoat and the lamb. Mm -hmm. The lamb is without blemish and is sacrificed. The scapegoat can have a blemish, but the sins of the people were placed upon the goat, and the goat was set free to carry the sins out. Barabbas was the scapegoat. Wow. Jesus was the lamb. All pieced together. And at the very hour that Jesus was crucified, the sacrificial lamb was slain in the temple. Now, that's deep. That's so deep. That is deep. But there's so much symbolism in that that we miss it because we don't know what the Scripture says. In the Hebrew. In the Hebrew. Yeah. And it, it's so important to learn some of that. The, 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 the one thing that an inmate will understand about what Jesus did on the cross is they know what it means to take the rap for somebody. Hmm. That's, that's just good. a prison term. They take the rap for them. Yeah. If you watch TV shows, you know what it means to. Don't lie to me. <laughs> Y'all know what it. Y'all been watching them TV shows and cop shows out there. <laughs> Y'all know what it means to take a rap. But Jesus took the rap for us. He took our place. He did. But the Bible didn't say that he just took my place. <clears throat> he did more than that. <clears throat> it says he became sin. Not just took it. Mm -hmm. He became sin. That's so deep. That is a deep thought. Especially because he's without, without blemish. You know? But he became sin for what purpose? So that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. So yes, when he took our place, he exchanged places. Here we are in sin. Here he is in righteousness. He switched them. 
You, so you think that's why Barabbas' name was Barabbas? I don't think that's by accident. Right. It's a kingdom thread. I think that is one of the definite kingdom threads in the, in the uh, plan of God for us to see. All through the Bible, when you read the Bible, Zach, there are threads throughout there from the beginning of Genesis all the way to Revelations on the bloodline of Christ and mm -hmm. on the sacrificial system. Everything in there is a shadow and a type of heavenly things. Everything that you see on earth is a shadow of something that's in the heavenly realm. And that's, that's something that boggles the mind. The mind just goes. <clears throat> is that why a lot of times, you know, when, um, you know, things will, will be in the spirit, but not in the, in the natural yet? You know, like a prayer will be answered in the spirit. It just hasn't happened in the natural. Well, consider Daniel. He prayed, and the angel gets there with the answer for his prayer 21 days later. You can read about that in Daniel, yeah. if you want to go read Daniel. Yeah, and the, the angels were, the, the spiritual realm was fighting over those prayers. Yes, requests. he said that your prayer was answered the day you prayed, mm, but, it took but I was withheld by the prince of Persia, which is a spiritual force, which was the angel of, of the area of Persia that was withholding him until Michael and his angels came to defeat them. Mm. Now, you've got to understand in the Bible, there is a level of hierarchy in the angels. Most people don't even know that. Yeah. But you have the uh, archangels. You have the soldier angels. It's like a military. You, yeah. have the prince, you have the principalities and powers. Yeah. And you have both fallen and faithful angels. Yep. Now, here's a catch. How many of the angels did Lucifer take with him when he fell? One third. One third, which means what? I don't know. What? It means for every fallen angel, there's two regular angels, one on either side to take him away. Hey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I knew that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I just wanted you to say it for the people. Yeah. Well, they're outnumbered two to one to start with, so <laughs> you, you wonder why they uh, I gotta see fight so hard. <laughs> you, you can picture that in your mind. Now, I, I get tickled that. The Bible says that there's nothing new under the sun in Ecclesiastes. Mm -hmm. The devil only attacks people through the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, mm -hmm. and the pride of life. That's right. Now, What scripture is that, by the way, where it says that? I heard that twice this week. Uh, I'd have to look it up to okay. tell you that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the location. No, of it but right I, I, I heard head. that the same scripture reference but, this week. Yeah, I believe it's in John. Okay. But uh, that's the only way he attacks. Yes. Now... What affects one person may not affect another. It's your own lust. James says that we're drawn away of our own lust mm -hmm. when we miss God. But the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh is the first two things the devil uses to draw us away. So what he likes doing is he takes his little trinkets and he waves them like this and then he goes like that and you go... Yeah, you start looking, you start... start to well, look. you start looking at it, and then you start following it. Next thing you know, you're off the path. Now, I don't know how many people have ever studied geometry. But if you start a straight line, and you have a parallel line that's supposed to go with it, and at the starting point A, you have a .95 discrepancy to the side, the further it travels out, the broader the gap gets. That's right. Well. Okay. You got six months out. May not be too bad. A year out, you're getting in dangerous water. Five years out, there may be a broad abyss there. Mm. You go ten years out in the wrong direction, you may not even know where God is anymore. Because God didn't move, you did. Yeah, and you move far. And the further away you go, the harder it is to come back sometimes. Mm. Consider the prodigal son. He wanted all of what his dad had for him. He said, give it to me, it's mine, I want it now. And he gave it to him and he went out and it says he squandered it. I like that phrase, he squandered it. Yeah. He just right, right. Rancor is living out there, just Quickly. living it up. 
you know, he's having that grand party. I picture a teenager, early 20-year-old. I picture like Johnny Manziel. They just living it up, not counting the cost. And next thing you know, he's out of money, he's out of clothes, he's out of work, and he's a long ways from home. He winds up taking a job feeding and slopping the hogs for some guy way out away from home. Now, a lot of people read that, Zach, in the Bible, and they don't think about what that means. But you got a Jewish boy that doesn't eat pork that's feeding the pork. Wow. That's true. I didn't even think about that. And he says that he came to his senses or came to himself is what one version says. When he's eating the, the pig food. And yeah. he's eating the same slop the pig's eating. That's disgusting. That's terrible. <laughs> and he comes to his senses, he comes to himself. Man, even the servants in my daddy's house is better than this. I'm going to get up and go home and just tell my dad that I'm not worried to be your son anymore. Just make me a hired hand. Just make me a servant. Well, yeah, we know if you read that, the father had been looking for him all this time. Mm -hmm. And when he saw him way off in the distance, it says the father came running to him. Open arms. Open arms to receive him back. And when he thought he'd just be a servant, his father said, oh, no, 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 no. Go get a robe for him. Clean him up. Put a ring on his finger. Put some shoes on his feet. Go, go kill the fatted calf. Let's have a feast. Yeah. My son who was lost has now come home. That's the way God sees us. That is the way God sees us. That's the way God sees us when we come home. And then the brother is how religious people are. The, the brother Pharisees. is the Pharisees. Yes. And they're not very fair, you see. Hey. <laughs> the other ones are the sad you sees. <laughs> That's gold. Yeah, I don't think they're named that by accident. Nope. But, you know, Jesus had more trouble out of the religious leaders in his day than anybody else around. Mm. Because when you consider what Jesus called them, he says, y'all are like a painted sepulcher, a tomb. You're all painted and pretty on the outside, and inside you're full of dead men's bones. <laughs> That's bold. People say Jesus was nice. Well, he turned some <laughs> tables over in the temple, too. And told them that this is the house of prayer and you made it a den of thieves. Mm -hmm. But uh, they sought to stone him on many occasions and never could get to him. Nope. And then what's really... Try to push him off a cliff too. Forget that part. Oh yeah, now here's what's interesting. The promise of the seed, Zach, was given in Genesis 3 and 15. Yes. Right after Adam and Eve sinned. The devil used Eve to bring about sin. Because he knew she didn't know all the information. Because when he asked her about the trees, she said something that wasn't said by God when she said you shouldn't even touch it. Because God never told Adam not to touch that tree. He said don't eat of it. Adam's job was to prune and trim that tree. But I can picture in my mind where Adam might have told Eve, honey, don't even worry about it, just don't even touch it. So that's probably where she got that from. Yeah, she, he's like, I'll take care of it. A lot of people want to blame Eve for the fall of man. But you better go back and read that passage real close because it said when she saw that it was desired to be eaten, she did take of the fruit and eat of it and gave it to her husband who was with her. You were side by side? Oh, yeah. He's standing there listening to the conversation and didn't do nothing about it. Wow. When he had the authority... To tell that stu that little serpent, shut up and go away. He had dominion over all the animals. He had dominion over all of them. And he didn't do nothing with that authority. And he did nothing. So here's my point on that point. What does it take for the evil to rule in the land? For Christian people to sit down and do nothing. Troy Brewer talked about that on mm. our episode. Whole yeah. lot of whole lot of couch Christianity since 2020. All you got to do is, I'll just sit here and wait for my 40 years to pass. I've been a good Christian sitting here. I'm doing fine. Yeah, what else are you doing? A whole lot of nothing. Yeah, because God didn't call you to be a bench seater. That's right. He said bench seater. Yeah, bench seater. <laughs> you're sitting on the bench. If you're in a sports team and they don't want you to play, where you at? You're riding the pine. 
You're on the bench. You're getting splinters in your butt. God didn't call you to be a bench, be, be over on the bench. Hmm? He wants you out there in the game. With the jersey of Christ on you. Yeah. But you see, what happened was when the devil used Eve to cause the fall of man, I just pictured in my mind, God says, really, devil? You're going to use my woman to do that? Let me show you what I'm going to do with her. Because in Genesis 3 and 15, it says the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. And the serpent is only going to be able to bruise not her heel, but his heel. Wow. Now, Lucifer didn't understand that at that point because he got Cain to kill Abel. Thinking it was just from that. Thinking yeah. that was their offspring. Because the devil is not all knowing people. No, he's not. But he thought that was the offspring of Adam and Eve. And it was the offspring of Adam and Eve. The only problem is you got to go biological on this one. Yeah, the genealogy? No, biological. Okay. If it's the seed of the woman, the pregnancy takes place from the seed of the man. Uh, the woman has an egg. That's right. How can it be the seed of a woman then? Mary. It had to be a virgin birth. The virgin birth of Mary. It had to be a virgin birth. Wow. Lucifer did not understand that until the time of Isaiah, the prophet, when he uttered the words, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Dang, so he was over here just in the wilderness trying to figure so for out this 2,000 years, how he's going to get He's trying to figure out how to get to this seed, and he don't even know what the seed is yet. He's still trying to fight for it, trying to track it down, trying to figure out how to kill it. And try to kill all try the babies? To, yeah, try, yeah, he killed all those in several different and that's, occasions. Do you think that's why child sacrifice was like so yes, rampant then? it was. He's trying to kill that seed all through history. Now, here's what's funny. When he finally understands that it's the virgin birth, and he finds the baby Jesus, tries to kill him too. Mm -hmm. But the angels warned them to leave and go to Egypt when Herod killed the children. Yeah. And then when he dies, the threat is gone. They come back. But at this point, Lucifer now knows who that seed is. He knows that it's Jesus. Mm -hmm. All through Jesus' earthly life, Lucifer tried to kill him. How many different times did the Jews, when he started his ministry, seek to stone him? I don't know the exact number, but a lot. All through the Gospels. Yeah. And it says he passed among them. They were not able to do it. Mm -hmm. Finally, when he gets him to the cross and he incites the people to kill him, crucify him, kill him, he thinks he's won because he's going to get the seed of the woman and he's going to kill it. Now, I don't know how long ago you graduated, but did you ever study uh, in school about uh, biology on plant life? Been a few years? I went to public school. Uh, well, they still taught you a little bit, maybe. Are you a farm boy? No, I'm a, I'm a hooper. Oh, okay, well... You, you you characters out there that are farm boys know what I'm talking about. When you plant a seed in the ground and it dies and germinates, what does it do? You're going to have to answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on now. Any farm boy out there going to already tell you the answer. This is the closest I've come to a plant in so long. <laughs> All right. When a seed, when you kill a seed and you plant it in the ground, it germinates and grows and multiplies. You took the seed of the woman and you killed him, and you buried him for three days, and then he multiplied. Because when he came out of the tomb. He brought others with him. Oh, yeah, and how many more Christians are there today? And Jesus' words was what? The works that I do shall you do also. And greater. Uh-huh, and greater works than these shall you do mm -hmm. because I'm going to my Father. So the power that God instilled into the disciples, he gave that to us. Now, here's something that I taught in the prison uh, two weeks ago, the week before you came up there with me. 
in our lesson that week on discipleship, we were talking about the authority in the Christian. The disciples had delegated authority. It was delegated by Jesus specifically to them to go out and to tread on serpents, to have power over the demons, and to minister to the people. That's delegated authority. That's because Christ had not been crucified yet. He had to delegate that to them. But once he consummated the covenant and we become the offspring of God, the children of God, the sons of God, we don't have delegated authority, Zach. We have genuine authority. Mm. We've got the real thing because Jesus told us after he rose from the dead, await in Jerusalem till you receive the power from on high. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us today. We have the genuine, authentic thing, not just the delegated authority of his word. We have the actual Holy Spirit living within us to minister to the people. So where we have that authority given mm. to us genuinely, there's no weapon formed against us that can prosper. And that kind of goes back to me saying, like, I didn't have that spirit of fear. It was a straight peace of God in the prison. And then also when we were there, it felt like kingdom business. You know, it was with the Holy Spirit and that authority of, like, going in there, like, we're on a mission here. We're, like, we're not here for selfish gain. We're not here to pass around a plate or raise money for anything that the ministry needs. We're here to just minister the word to these people. The, the one thing that I find a lot of the volunteers find out, Zach, is when they come in with a preconceived idea of what they're going to do for the inmates, <laughs> I just love watching them when I see what the inmates do for them. Bro, there was no better testament to this truth than Frank Brown. Oh, man. What did you think of Frank Brown? Frank Brown was a man of God. This dude was, uh, we just started talking, man. We just had a convo that led to him preaching to me, to led to me bouncing around with scripture. <laughs> I'm giving him oh, a nug. Man. He's giving uh, me nugs. I'm over here just like, ooh. I, I said, when do you get out, man? I got to get you on my podcast. <laughs> he was like, man. Did, did you years. find the person that had a kindred spirit that you recognized? His, mm -hmm. his knowledge of the word, his walk in the word. Of how much word that man knows. You're talking about Frank Brown still? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. Like it was, it was crazy. It was one of those things where I was. It was so, it was so powerful in every single aspect of it. Frank Brown doesn't view himself as an inmate. He views himself as an evangelist on a mission. And he walks in that, and I feel like you kind of need that when you're in there, right? You do. You need kind of a purpose. Well. Not only does he have purpose in what he's doing as an inmate in the prison, yeah. God is using him extensively for what he's going to be doing when he comes out. Mm. But only, also, he's, he's instilling in the other inmates that same power of the word. That's so good. And you see, so I'm there uh, once a month, once a week, every once in a while. He's there day after day after day among them. Wow. And he sees the walk that the man has. They see that. And that, that's a very powerful testimony. Now, what you probably don't know, Zach, is we're fixing to lose him from that unit. He's being transferred, I think you told me, right? Yes, he's fixing to be transferred to another unit. Uh, God's going to use him wherever he goes. Of course. But there's going to be a void in ministry there at that unit. And I find it very intriguing that as he's being moved to a new location, God's going to use him where he goes. But at the same time, he's being moved out. You remember I told you I'm going to be going in with another ministry now? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be going in with uh, Bridges to Life ministry on Wednesday nights. Wow. Teaching a class on Wednesday night at that unit, my own self, which will take the place of what he was doing. See how God moves? That's crazy. And then you got that opportunity from this podcast? Yes. From just doing the show and, like, people seeing it? That and uh, going to the banquet and just 
being there. people knowing that I do ministry. Yeah. And to be able to hear your story like this in a, in a way that people can consume it on their own accord, I think it's so special that uh, it led to opportunities for you. So well, I'm, I'm so grateful to hear that. One, one of the biggest things, Zach, that a lot of people out there don't understand, and I just talked to y'all directly on this. You, you may think sometimes that your testimony doesn't mean anything, but you never know who's watching, who's listening, and is needing those exact words that you could share with that person if you're just willing to open up and become vulnerable. You have to be able to listen to the Holy Spirit, listen to who he says to minister to, and then go do it. Does that mean you have to share of yourself sometimes? Yes. Yeah. It does. I know of a friend of mine. She learned a hard lesson, and she came to me crying because she was disappointed because she said, I blew it. I missed it. I had a chance to minister to someone, and I messed it up. I failed. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said that she had took someone to the airport to drop them off, and she very surely knew that God told her to go speak to a person there in the airport. And she hesitated on going to speak to them. And she said, well, I need to go to the bathroom first. So she went to the bathroom, and when she come back out, that person was gone. Dang. Don't go pee before the Lord calls you to minister, yo. If she had gone to speak to the person first and said, look, I'd like to have a word with you, but I, I need to use the restroom for a moment. Can you wait for me? She had to go back and bury her father, pretty much? Well, that's what Scripture came to my mind. Yeah. When, when we're called to minister mm -hmm. and, and we have reasons why we don't want to do that now and we make excuses, yeah. sometimes you miss the mark. Now, will God put somebody else in that person's life? Yes. But you miss that chance when you do that hmm. to minister to that person. Because when you, the Bible says if you even give a glass of water to somebody in the name of Jesus, wow. that you have your reward for that. Heavenly reward? Yes, you have a heavenly reward for that. Wow. You never know how much your life can affect other people. That's so good, yeah. Now, I, I have been known to have people uh, ask friends of mine. In fact, I overheard a conversation at church one Sunday uh, with the uh, gentleman that lives on my property in the RV with me. Uh, he put his RV on my property. Uh, they were talking to him, and I'm walking by, and I overheard the conversation. And they said, does Charlie ever talk about anything other than the Bible? <laughs> And, you know, I, I heard that, and I'm interested in what his answer was going to be because he and I have known each other for so long. And uh, I had to chuckle at his answer because he said, if you don't want to hear about the Bible, don't talk to Charlie. <laughs> Cause don't he, come up. Because <laughs> he said that if you know me very long, if you talk to me very long, the Bible is going to come up in the conversation. Not just the Bible, the Hebrew, the Greek. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible is going to come up in the conversation, Zach. Uh, and th there's so much of a wealth of information at our disposal mm -hmm. that we actually have available to us in this country. Yes. That other countries don't get. Yeah, they rip out pages of Scripture and hide it. And yeah, they hide it and save it because they're hungry for the Word. Yeah. But I got news for you. There is an outpouring of the Spirit, mm. outpouring of the Word going on around the world. Absolutely. And if you don't believe we're in the last days coming up soon, you need to take a rude awakening and look around because God is moving yes. in many countries. He's, he's going to bring things about in this country, and you might not like the results hmm. because God's judgments will come. Birthing pains. The birthing pains of his coming. Now, I like it— uh, because the earth is trembling at his approach. Now, let me tell you a couple of things that I'm aware of that has happened in the last five years that the average person out there may not know. The Bible says that in the last days, there's going to be signs in the heavens and the sun, the moon, and the stars pertaining to the return of Christ. The star that was above Bethlehem has already been seen when the three planets lined up in the sky a few years back. Remember that? Mm -hmm. 
formed that beautiful star that hadn't been seen for hundreds of years. Yeah. That was in the sky. Everybody saw it. The Hubble telescope took a picture of the sun's surface. Mm. Now, it said there'll be signs in the sun. On the surface of the sun, when the photograph was developed from the Hubble telescope, the Hebrew letter Dalith was clearly seen on the surface of the sun. What? The Hebrew letter what is, I heard, Dalith. But what, like, what does that mean? What does that Hebrew the word Hebrew mean? The Hebrew letter Dalith is door. The Bible says there'll be an open door in the heavens, seen in the heavens. Hello. Wow. There's a door out there. It's already been seen. Jeez. You better be paying attention. Things are happening in the spiritual realm that people are not aware of happening. They're not knowledgeable of scriptures. They're not knowledgeable of what is going to take place because they don't bother to read the word anymore. Hmm. If you read the word and you know what the prophecies are saying, you know what the... Uh, events are going to be. Do you think everything going on in Israel right now is by accident? Absolutely not. Do you have any idea who this group over there, Hamas, is? Terrorist organization. You familiar with Genesis chapter 6, where the evil was in the land continuously before the flood? Yes. The Hebrew word for that evil in the land in Genesis 6 mm -hmm. is Hamas. Yep. It's not new. Ecclesiastes 3 says there's nothing new under, under the, the sun. sun. Hamas has still been around. They didn't name their group Hamas by accident. It's the evil in the land. And just as it was in the days of Noah, what does the Bible say? In the last days, so shall it be. So if you're looking around and you read what went on prior to the flood and you look around the world today, hey, hello, I don't see anything different. I'm seeing some of the same stuff, some of the same evil in the land continually. And what do you think the biggest problem was, Zach? Hmm. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Yes. The only problem with that, you see, what the devil told Eve when she ate of that fruit is you're going to be just like God if you eat of it. They were already like God. <laughs> they were. They were. They were made in his image. They were already the in his image. The apex of humanity. So that liar deceived them. Yeah. But you see, we have to be aware of the evil in the land to see what's going on around us. Because the Bible says to come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. To touch not the unclean things. It says to present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is only your reasonable service. So what does that mean? We march to a different drummer. We really do. If you are wrapped up in the cares of this world and all of your life drills around what the world is doing, what the news is talking about, what the TV show is talking about, what the artists out there are talking about, all the entertainment's talking about, and you, that's all you live for is the cares of this life. When that trump sounds, you're going to miss it because you're not listening. That's real. That is real, Zach. They're going to miss it because the parable of the ten virgins very clearly says they were all virgins. Five of them went, five of them got left. The five that had oil in their lamps, mm -hmm. trimmed and burning, mm -hmm. listening for the call of the bridegroom, mm -hmm. heard the call. The other five, they heard the call, but they had to go get some oil. Got to keep that oil filled, man. Well, if keep you don't have your filled. suitcase packed and ready, <laughs> you're not going to go on the trip. Dang, that's good, Charlie. Yeah, you're not. And that, that's so good that you say that because I feel like that's something that you can communicate so well to the inmates as well when you're ministering to them. And so I have to ask you, what is that feeling 
for you when you see one of the inmates accept salvation like we did see that past Saturday? We did. We had one come to Christ that Saturday. We had one come to Christ uh, that Thursday night. Uh, when I see them accept the reality of what Christ has done, they're beginning on a journey. But I have confidence in knowing that they've got brothers in there that will surround them, love them, and guide them and instruct them. You see, they don't just stand there by themselves. They got, they've got such a church body inside the institution that the churches out here should be embarrassed for not having the same thing. I think you witnessed that. Yeah. The aver- One of the things I tell the inmates when they're coming out, because they say, well, what do I need to know about going out? I said, well, here's one thing you're going to have to learn, and uh, it's a reality that you're going to have to check on because when you're going outside and you're looking for a church home, they're far and few between on finding one that does what they do in here. You're going to find some good churches that preach the word. But to find a service that is as pure and open to God as what that is in there, it's hard to find it. How many years did it take you to find that? Uh, Zach, when I came home from prison 20 years ago, I had nine different churches ask me to leave. Because of your past? Because of my record. Because of my past. I had one pastor tell me that he didn't want me in his church and when I quoted the scriptures to him about what it took to put someone out of a church that if the person is walking in sin you confront the person if they repent you restore them if they fail to hear you you go and bring two or three witnesses they fail to hear that you bring the elders of the church if they fail to hear that then you bring it before the body of the church then and only then if they fail to hear that do you dismiss them from the assembly that man told me he didn't care what the Bible said He didn't want me in his church, and if I didn't leave, he's going to call the cops. And he was the pastor of the church. Wow. Now, that's the standard pastors that are out there in the average church. And and that's why I think it's so important because I I respect you because you you don't use that as a way of— bashing Christianity or, like, you know, the Christian faith or God. It's like you see it as the— the church is is a little bit is lost in the way they conduct if you read the unwanted. The, Zach, if you read the seven churches in the book of Revelations, mm-hmm. not only are they physical churches in that land that you can locate on the map of that day, they are also representative of a time frame of the church throughout history. The Laodicean church, the last one mentioned, is the lukewarm church. We are in the age to where we still have the Philadelphia church in the land that is still ministering the word, still doing what God called them to do. But forgot our first love? But they forgot their first love. But you also have the Laodicean church that is lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. Now, he says for the other one to, that forgot your first love to repent. So he's calling us to repentance. But he told the Laodicean church in, if you want to put it in Texas English, you make me puke. Because <laughs> he said that because you're neither hot nor cold, I'll spew you out of my mouth. In other words, you make, you make me sick. Yeah. Now, when God says that that form of religion makes him sick, and we're offering that to God as a sacrifice, that's what you're bringing to the altar? To me, that just makes me sick. And the problem with that is the world has become so churchy. The church has become so worldly. It's really hard to tell the difference anymore because they, they cross the barrier with each other and you don't find holiness anymore. You don't find the blood of Jesus being taught anymore. You don't find the sacrifice the sacrifice of Christ for redemption being taught anymore. There's a few churches out there still teaching that. Mm -hmm. But you know what the problem, Zach, is? When you preach the word of God in its purity, you offend the people. Paying your light bill. 
Well, <laughs> it don't bring the money in. It don't bring the almighty dollar in. Mm -hmm. If you tell somebody that the way they're living is sinful and they need to repent, they get offended. Now, I will say this. If you leave a church because you're offended at something in that church, you can go find you another church that will be right up your alley. It will match everything you believe, and you be comfortable sitting in that pew. But you better be very, very careful, my friend, because you may split hell wide open. That's a good word right there. Because God did not call you to jump from church to church. No, we need to be planted. Not only do you need to be planted, you need to recognize when the word of God as my dad told me when I was growing up, knock the shine off my shoes. Mm, I like that expression. That's good. I need to stop and ask, why is he stepping on my toes to knock the shine off? So if it's stepping on my toes, it means it's getting to me about something I've been doing. Mm. Okay, now you can do one of two things at that point. You can say, okay, God, I'm listening. I hear you and do something about it. Or you can resist it, ignore it, and keep on going. But as we said well ago, the further you go, the further away you get. Yeah. So don't be resisting the Holy Spirit forever. There's going to come a point to where God's going to take his hands off and say, enough's enough. Now, I, w I did have one inmate ask me, Zach, a very serious question. He said, can you lose your salvation? I said, no. But I will warn you about this. The book of Hebrews says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens often. And he said, if there's no discipline in your life, the King James Version says you're a bastard and not a son. You're an illegitimate child. But if you're a child of God and you go out and live in sin, God's not going to let you get by with that. There's going to be a time of judgment coming. And if you think you're going to continue living in this life, in disobedience, you better go back and read Acts chapter 5. Are you familiar with Ananias and Sapphira? A little bit. They simply lied to the Holy Ghost. Mm. Told a lie in the church house. And were struck dead on the spot. Oh, that's right. That part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that part. Yeah, that part, Zach. <laughs> yes, that part. They were struck dead on the spot. For lying to the Holy Ghost. Yeah, if you opened with that, it would have been more, yeah, but. Yeah, well. Sheesh. Yeah, it's that serious though, yeah. Zach. Mm -hmm. But people don't think about that. That's New Testament too. <laughs> you know, yes, like, that's New Testament. That's still new. You know, like, people are always like the wrath of God is only in the Old Testament. Like, no, 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 no. It's Acts in the chapter new 5. <laughs> Acts chapter 5. You better go read it. I find it very interesting though that there's two people in the Old Testament that were killed because of offering strange fire that happened to be the two sons of the priest, Aaron. Mm. They were the preacher's kids. <laughs> yeah. Your daddy's salvation won't get you saved, huh? No. <laughs> and they went into the tabernacle and offered fire that God did not call for and did not ask for, and they were struck dead on the spot in the Old Testament. Wow. And in the New Testament, you have Ananias and Sapphira, that lied to the Holy Ghost about the offering that they brought, and they were struck dead. Sheesh. In fact, I find it interesting that he died first. Mm. And then when his wife comes in, they questioned her and said, did you not get such and such for the uh, land that you sold? Why is it that you conceived with your husband to lie to the Holy Ghost? Behold, the ones that bore his body out or even at the door to carry you out, and she fell dead. Powerful stuff, man. Yes. There's meat in there. Well, most people would read that and say, yeah, it's just a story. You willing to bet your life on that? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not either. <laughs> I'm not, <either>. <laughs> not going to gamble on that one. Mm -mm. So I do got to ask you when you when you found that church after nine of them turned you away, how did it feel? Did you feel at home? Did you feel like God answered your prayers? What, what were your thoughts on that? I stayed out of church for over two and a half years when I first came home. After the nine turned me away, yeah, 
I stayed out for nearly two and a half years of not going to church at all. Even with your credentials and all that, they still. Oh yeah, that had. Wow. My my going to Bible college and uh, having credentials and everything didn't mean anything to them. The see the problem, Zach, is we look too much at the physical past of people rather than where they're at currently. Mm-hmm. They want to hold the grudge against people. They only see what's on paper. They only see what they want to see. If you want to see evil, you can see evil in everything. If you're looking for it, it's out there. But what you have to look at is the heart of the person and where they're at today. Now, if you want to talk about the past of people, let's go through that for a moment. The disciples themselves. Matthew was a tax collector. He wasn't looked on as being very friendly because tax collectors of the day were evil. They robbed people of their money, overtaxed them, and kept the money for themselves. They wasn't very well spoke of. Right? For sure. The Apostle Paul was a murderer consenting to the death of Stephen. Yep. Gambled with his, for his clothes. Oh, yeah. Uh, Peter was a hot-headed fisherman that cut a soldier's ear off. That's for Jesus, though. Had a temper. <laughs> How about the two sons of Zebedee, known as the sons of thunder? I think maybe they had an attitude, too. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about King David. The Bible says he's a man after God's own heart. And he out here committing really? adultery and killing people. He was an adulterer, a rapist, and a murderer. He was a rapist, too? He took another man's wife. Dang. He sent for her. He's the king of Israel. She's going to tell him no. That classifies as rape. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the Jeez. Bible said he was a man after God's own heart. But Dang. there's one difference there. Go read Psalms 51, and you'll read that prayer that David prayed when Nathan the prophet confronted him. Because when Nathan the prophet came to confront him about all that he had done, he told him the story about the little ewe lamb that the man took from his neighbor and could have had anyone in the kingdom, but he took that one ewe, and David said, that man should not live. And he said, you are the man, O king. I can imagine David's face going, What? And he repented, and Psalms 51 is the prayer that he prayed after that. Wow. So, yeah, you're saying all these things of, like, all these Bible characters that we that we study, that we love and we revere, they all had a troubled past of great severity. They did. Indeed, they did. We're no different. And yet we turn people away from a church nine times? Well, my, my question is, in turning the people away like they turned me away I could have become bitter about that but the one thing that sustained me through those years is I know who I serve mm. come on I'm not sure who they're serving mm -hmm. but I know who I serve I know the God that I have you see I've been down a road that a lot of people haven't been on and I don't begrudge that road one bit because of what God brought me through to train me and teach me for where I am today. Now, in the year 2000, I was in a psych ward, not wanting to live, giving up on life, questioning my faith, questioning did I really believe, did I not believe, and God, where are you? That year, my son died, my mother died, my wife died. I was set off for five years on parole, and my brother that I was going to go live with was in an accident and in a nursing home. All in the same year? All in the same year. Don't put anybody in a psych ward. I'm trying to do the Bible college lessons at that time in my life. I lost all hope because it broke me down so badly. I said, what is the use of continuing? God, where are you? 
and I collapsed and closed up. I wouldn't talk. I wouldn't eat. I wouldn't do nothing. I'm actually sitting Zach over in the corner of the day room, curled up in a ball in the corner, not wanting to talk to nobody. They come to ask me what's wrong. I didn't answer. I wouldn't talk. They took me up to the infirmary. The building major of the unit came in, and he asked me what was wrong. I wouldn't answer. Then he asked me a very pointed question, Zach. He said, if I put you back in the cell tonight, are you going to be okay? And I remember very clearly, even to this day, what I said. And I looked him straight in the eyes, and this is the first thing I'd said in two weeks. If you put me back in there the way I feel right now, I'll be dead by morning. Think about that. I know who I serve today, but at that point in my life, the devil had beat me down so far that I had lost hope, I had lost vision. He was trying to drown the voice of God out. He's trying to get me to give up on life. They sent me to the psych unit for two weeks. I'm dressed out in a suicide prevention cell. I've got a little bitty window where I can see about a quarter of a mile from the unit, a signal light out there, going from green to yellow to red, from green to yellow to red, green to yellow to red. And in my thoughts, Zach, what I was thinking at that moment was, green, do I continue? Yellow, I'm not sure, I don't know. Red, I just give up and stop. Which one do I do? What do I believe anymore? Now, in a suicide prevention cell, you're not allowed to have anything sharp. You're not allowed to have anything dangerous. But somebody that got in that cell ahead of me by divine providence had a pencil. And on the wall of that cell, a heart was drawn from the ceiling to the floor, a big old huge heart. And the only thing I had to look at in my hour of despair was Jesus loves you, written in the middle of that heart. You know what the problem was that I had? I wasn't sure whether I believed that anymore. And I found out something in that point in my life. It's hard to live with yourself when you're the only one there. The Bible lessons that I've been studying all those years leading up to that point, I'm reading on the wall where it says Jesus loves me and I'm arguing with it. Do I believe that or not? If he does, this don't feel like love. God, where are you? I'm struggling with this. And for every objection that I had in my brain going on at that point in my life, all them scriptures that I was learning in Bible college were flooding my brain. Wow. That's cool. Every single objection that I brought up was countermanded by the Word of God. Let's go. Now, when they finally came around to check on me, because I hadn't spoke to anybody in two weeks, even after they sent me there, I didn't see no reason to talk to nobody. I didn't have nothing to say. I'm still sorting my own thoughts out. What's the use of talking about it? I, I'm not sure where I am. I'm not sure what I want to say. Why say anything? You bring me food. Why well, don't I want to eat that? I don't know whether I want to live or not. I didn't feel like eating. But when they came around, that second week I was there, and they brought the food tray to the door, I said, thank you, I'm hungry. I heard what the person out in the hallway said. Hey, somebody call him, he's talking. And then they come up to check on me. And when I talked to them about what I'd been going through, they asked me what it was and I explained to them what I'd been fighting with, what I'd been thinking. 
And they determined that I wasn't crazy. I wasn't suicidal. I just had a major nervous breakdown. But I have never in my life been that low since. Now, when you had me on the podcast last November, we were talking about that house burning down. Mm-hmm. We talked about me standing out in the front yard, singing. shaking my fist at that house, mm-hmm. singing the song Fires about you walked me through fire, you brought me through flame. That's right. If I had not been through that experience in 2000, I think my response would have been different last year. But because of that experience in 2000, I've had a lot go on since then. But it's going to be mighty hard to shake my faith anymore since then. Absolutely. Because I know in whom I believe in. I I settled that in 2000. And when that light came back on, that flicker of hope lit back up. Because I was arguing with the Word of God is what I was arguing with. And here's what I had to determine, Zach. Either the Word of God is true or it's not. It is either who he says he is or he's not. Can't be both. And when I came to the conclusion that the Word of God is true, that God is true, And that it don't matter how I feel. It don't matter what I see or what I don't see. It's what does the word say that I have. And then when I began living by that in the year 2000, putting that into practice, even while I was still locked up, nothing had changed that pertaining to my date of release. Nothing had changed that my mother was gone. Nothing had changed that I'd lost everything. It was still the same stuff. But I had a hope that was within me. And the Bible says that we all have a blessed hope within us, who is Christ in us. See, that is our hope. Christ living in us. Now, I have a difference of opinion with a lot of ministers pertaining to which translation of Bible you read because words mean something. Yes, they do. In Galatians 2 and verse 20, okay, it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh The King James says, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Some of the other versions says, I live by faith in the Son of God. Now, I have a problem with that because if it's my faith in him, it's my effort. But if I go by the Greek text and it says, I live by the faith with a definite article, the faith of the Son of God, That's not my faith. That's his faith residing in me. Interceding. Yeah. You see, that's not my ability. That's God's ability living in me. This all comes down to Jesus. It does. Now, you asked me a question before the broadcast today about the necklace that I had on on the last uh, Last video. Last episode, yeah. Yeah, last time we had that. And it's a Star of David, which is the Jewish star. And has a cross in the middle of it. It's a messianic symbol. Our faith as Christians comes from the Jewish religion. It's to the Jews first, the Gentiles second. The Star of David is two triangles interwoven. One pointing up, one pointing down. To where you have six points all the way around. The covenant of Abraham is to his seed, his offspring, which would be to the Jews. How then did we as Gentiles get grafted in? Through Jesus. Through Jesus, but how did that happen? Let me give you a Bible lesson on that real quick, people, because if you go back to the Old Testament, to chapter 12 of Genesis, 
to the cutting of the covenant of Abraham. The sacrificial animal is halved in half. And the Bible says that the smoking furnace of God passed between the pieces. The smoke that came out of the incense burner as he walked through formed a Hebrew letter in the smoke for guarantor. He's the guarantor of the covenant. Abraham never passed between those pieces. Now what is said at that point of cutting a covenant is thus shall it be done unto me if I change the words of this agreement. Mm. Now, the covenant was given to Abraham and his offspring in order to graft the Gentiles into Abraham. The guarantor has to die. How does God die? By becoming flesh. He had to become flesh in order to die. Zach, you're right. You see, it was planned from the beginning of the world, from the foundation of the world forward, that the Lamb of God would be slain for the salvation and redemption of man because the fall of man in Genesis did not catch God off guard. He knew it was going to happen before it ever happened. He knew Lucifer was going to rebel before he ever rebelled. Nothing catches God off guard because he's all-knowing. Does the devil not realize that? The devil is not omnipotent. He doesn't know everything. But does he not know that God knows everything and is in control of everything? He doesn't want to admit that. Yeah, it's pride. He has pride because pride is his great fall. Yeah. But you see, God already knew ahead of time. And in order to change that covenant, God had to die. And he died when he became man. Wow. For our, he had to do that in order to restore us. And this is planned before we were ever born. Yep. Before we were ever created. Before the heavens or earth were ever assembled. That's so wild. The plan was already it. in place. Yeah. People don't get that. That God's plan was in place before everything else happened. He already knows what's going to happen. He knows who's going to come and who's not going to come. But he doesn't interfere with our free will. He knows what your choice is going to be. He could change that if he wanted to, but he's not going to. If we ask him to change it, will he? No, because he's already gone, he already knows whether we're going to ask him. But you kind of you know when God changed His mind about skipping over the generation of of uh, Israel, Israelites that never got to see the Promised Land, and He changed His mind. Moses interceded for Israel. Joshua interceded for him. David interceded for him. Christ interceded for him. Christ even prayed for us before we was ever born. Read John 17, you'll find us in there. Because hmm. he didn't pray just for the 12 disciples. He prayed for those that would come to Christ through their words and their testimony. Mm, and that's us. That's us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he prayed for us too. God did not get caught off guard with any of that. But what it boils down to, Zach, is either God has to be preeminent and be who he is, or he's not. Now, I met a man at uh, a restaurant the other day. I really left disappointed because he's so set in his beliefs that he doesn't believe in God, that it's just a storybook, that it's just written by man. And he's so consumed with that thought that he's believed the lie. I used to get upset over stuff like that. Yeah. Because you can't reach everybody. Yeah, even though you want to. You want to, but you can't. But you've got to understand that the Bible says that because they knew God, yet they did not honor him as God, God gave them over to a reprobated mind to believe the lies. As, as I was saying, Zach, the word of God is either got to be true or not true. Yeah. There's going to be people out there we'll never be able to reach because they believe the lie. Yes. And the devil has deceived them to believe the lie. But God already knew who those people are. And in his mercy, he still offers them the same salvation that is offered to anybody else. Wow. Knowing that they're going to reject him, he still offers it. Yep. I love that verse, John three eighteen. 
that we were talking about in our last episode that you got to mm-hmm. accept it. And if you don't, you're condemned. Condemned already for not yeah, having for not, accept- yeah, for not accepting the son. For not accepting yeah. the son. I made a minister mad here a while back because I told him there's no sin that takes you to hell. Yeah, that's what we were kind of talking about on the episode is that. Yeah, because sin is not what takes you to hell. It's a rejection of Christ. Hmm. It's sin. not accepting Christ a sin then? It's the ultimate sin. Yeah. But all the others are byproducts of rejecting him. Yeah. It's not the other sins that take you to hell. The rejection of Christ is what sends you there for not having accepted the payment made. Hmm. you got a blank check written for eternal life, and all you got to do is cash in on it. I bet you can't wait to get there. Uh, Zach, I've already been there once and back. That's another story. Oh, part three? <laughs> Maybe part three, but I've already seen Evan once. Uh, well, I'm saying part three as meaning like another episode. It could be, but yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, I attempted suicide in my life during those years, and I saw heaven. And I was very disappointed because I was told I had to come back. And that I was also told by that being on that road, which I believe was Jesus himself, that in going back, he was going to show me what great and mighty things he was going to do with my life. I think we're we're seeing that right now. We're seeing the fruit of that right I now. I think I'm living that right now. Yeah, absolutely. Just I think I'm definitely living that. From our experiences to what you do at your church, playing keys, to what you do with sign language ministry, to what you do with the nursing home ministry, to what you do with the prison ministry, you're living for Christ, man, in a big and mighty way. Well, you know, Zach, that's something that the average Christian needs to learn is we are to minister the gospel wherever we be. As we go. As we go throughout the world. That's right. See, everybody wants to take the Great Commission in Matthew 28 and try to make it say, go ye therefore into the world or throughout the world. The Greek text doesn't say that, people. It says, as you are going throughout the world. That's right. That means wherever I find myself to be, preach the gospel. Yeah, our, our preacher actually uh, said that this past Sunday as well. And I was like, let's go. He said, as you go. As you are yeah. going, wherever you find yourself to be. In other words, you've got to be instant, in season, out of season, everywhere you go to share the light of Christ with someone. You shouldn't have to walk into a room and say, how do you do? I'm a minister. <laughs> You're right. You shouldn't have to go in and say, how do you do? I'm a Christian. If they talk to you over five minutes, it ought to be obvious. It should definitely be on you. Your life should be the sermon. It should be obvious of who you stand for. The the question is, are you enough witness throughout your daily life, or are you just living a Sunday morning Christian service? Mm. Hello. How you doing? Are you just there on Sunday mornings? That's why when, when Christians don't listen, I like birds. I'm like, oh, you just go to church on Sunday? <laughs> That's all you do. You don't want this Monday through Friday word as well. Oh, <laughs> nah. no, they, they want to be the parakeet. Yeah. It chirps a lot, but never says nothing. <laughs> we like birds, not those birds. <laughs> well, Zach, when you talk about you like birds, uh, my ministry would be I like jailbirds. Hey, there you go. Because that's ultimate freedom that they're seeking. Yes, you know? and I'm setting them free. You are, in the name of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I, I take the word to them to set them free. Now, there's a lot of people walking around out here on the street that's in jail. They're imprisoned mm. in their heart and in their mind. They're just as much in prison as the inmates that's contained in a cell because they're locked up in their sins. They're locked up in their self. They're locked up in the pride of life, the cares of this life, and they've missed God all the way around. Wow. And they're more in prison than the average person. And some of them don't have a clue of how to get out of it, how to get free. What would you say to those people right now that, if they're listening? The one thing I would say is turn back to the Word of God and let it speak. Hmm. The Word of God is living and alive. You have to let it speak to your heart. You'll never understand the whole Bible on your own. You, you have to have the Holy Spirit to guide you in the understanding of the Word. Yep. But you also have to put it in there. 
And if you don't hear it, the Word of God says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The more you hear the Word of God, the more it bears witness to yourself. Mm. But how do you know how to live by it if you don't know what it says? You, hear it, you heard it here. Hear, you heard it. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> well, you you've got read to, the Word of God. You've got to learn what it says. Now, here's my suggestion to you, Zach. In the book of Proverbs, there's 31 chapters. There is not a month in the year that doesn't have at least those chapters. Some have 30, some have 28, 29, but there's 31 chapters in Proverbs. That's one per day for every month of the year. In February, on the last day, you get to read either two or three. Surprise. <laughs> but there's one for each year. Yeah, each month, yeah. Or each yeah. day of the month. Now, in the book of Proverbs, do you have a scripture in your mind that comes to your mind in Proverbs that you tell them to live by right now? Uh, the words have the power of life and death. What scripture in Proverbs would you send them to right now? How about chapter 3? That's a good one. Are you familiar with that one? I know it's one of my favorites. Yep. And what's it say? I uh, can't tell you off the top of my head, but I okay. remember that one being the one that I highlighted and circled a oh, bunch. Oh, you circled that one. Yeah. What does it say? You got a Bible right there. Look right. it up. Let's go. Give it to them where they know what it says. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. You about to read the whole thing? I want you to read it now. I give it to you. You go ahead and read it. Proverbs 3. Right there for it. Trust the Lord. My son, don't forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commands, for they will bring you many days of full life and well-being. Never let loyalty, faithfulness leave you. Tie them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Mm -hmm. Then you will find favor and high regard with God and people. Mm -hmm. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know him and he will make your path straight. Isn't that what I just said? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 3. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This will be healing for your body and strengthening for your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce and with the first produce of your entire harvest. Then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. Do, mm -hmm. do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe his, dis his discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as a father yeah. disciplines the son in whom he delights. Mm -hmm. And if you get that point of it, a trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding but in all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths hmm. if you get just that much of it yeah and can walk by that he'll give you the rest of it you just have to acknowledge him in all of your ways that's right in everything that you do that means driving down the road somebody cuts you off you don't be go talk bad about them. Don't have the sign of the fish back there on the back of your car and then give them that sign language that you're hitchhiking to heaven. Goes, Giving him the other bird. <laughs> that's not the way you win them to Christ. No. Now, uh, I do have a, a young man that I'm discipling right now, and he gets tickled at me because when people cut me off like that, I just simply say, Lord, bless that fool before he kills himself or somebody else. <laughs> It's a nice way to put it. Well, I pray for them that God either yeah, you pray, protects you them pray. or protects yeah. the rest of us, one of the two. Yeah. Because they don't know what they're doing. They, they're they acting stupid. You know, You know, God laughs and winks at some of the things people do. Absolutely. He's got to. We're, we must be the best comedy show of all time. I think so because God has a merciful heart. He knew what man was and what we are yeah and the bible says that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked in all of his ways right that's why when people say god knows my heart i'm always like "Ooh, but what about that scripture yeah he knows your heart <laughs> that is deceitfully wicked in all of its ways 
That's because the Bible says that there is a way that seems right unto man in his own eyes, but the ways thereof are the ways of death. Hmm. You might just die from it. All right, this was an incredible conversation with my friend Charlie Owens. Man, I'm just so grateful you came back on our show, man. So thank you for being here again today and just sharing another element of your story as well as your heart for the Lord and just your ministry in the prisons, man. It was special to go with you. So thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to you coming back in February on the third Saturday. Hey, I'll be there. Uh, I'm looking forward to God doing great things as you come in with us. Thank you. You know, you got those four visits as they process you. Mm -hmm. And once they get the final approval, I want to see you every month. Hey. Once a month. There we go. I'm excited, man. It's, yeah. That's good things. I'm really excited that this show and our our, um, our first episode led to you getting some other opportunities in the ministry world. I feel like that's so special to hear because it just shows the power of what a, a simple podcast can do. And, of course, we reached, you know, almost 2 million people online through your story and just through the clips that we were sharing of you. So I mm -hmm. uh, appreciate you coming on and just doing that. You're such you're so loved by, by the people. Well, the only thing I can say in closing is, let the word of God have preeminence in your life mm -hmm. and walk by it. Yeah. God will bless you in doing so. Absolutely. You, you have a choice, either live by his word or live by your word. And uh, you're going to find your word lacking sometimes. Mm -hmm. But his word never fails. It never changes. Yep. It goes yeah. without void. It does. And one thing that I understand is the word of God says that it is living and alive and it never returns void. It goes out and accomplishes that for which it's sent out to do. Mm. Amen. That's a good word. Hey, if this episode blessed you, I would really encourage you and really appreciate if you can support us in any way possible. I give you three options today. Number one, you can buy and support my book, 21 Days in Africa, which is about the mission trip that I went on where I was able to minister to the orphans and the widows out there. It's a very funny read. It's very lighthearted and it's uh, leading people closer to Christ while opening their spiritual eyes for what goes on in an impoverished country. So I would definitely appreciate that. You can either get that on Amazon or ilikebirdsministry.com. Also on ilikebirdsministry.com, you can support us with a one-time uh, seed offering if you guys want to do that. Or if you want to become an exclusive member to our um, community, you can go to patreon.com slash ilikebirds. And that way you can get early access to great episodes like these and exclusive content. And the most important part is you'd be supporting the ministry monthly so we can reach more people and more souls for Christ. So please consider doing that. It'd be super helpful. And I also want to give one great last shout out to the Launchbox uh, Collective here in Fort Worth. Yes. This has been an incredible opportunity. Uh, it's so fun making jokes and just seeing Dave laugh behind the camera. So this was truly a special experience. So if you are in the DFW, then please come check this out. You never know what the Lord would do when you're here. Mm -hmm. He might lead you to an event. He might lead you to uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the ministry opportunities that are here. He might lead you on stage to start worshiping. You never know what's going to happen when you walk through these doors. And as soon as I walked through the doors here, I got the tour and I felt the presence of God. Next thing you know, I was getting a membership right away. So I encourage that as oh, well. I hear you. Yeah. You know, you felt I'm when, impressed when you feel that you impressed. I'm impressed. Yeah. You saw everything here and just I've the, seen everything. And I, I think they got a good thing going here. Yeah, absolutely. The spirit of excellence is here. So I believe that marketplace ministry, you know, the church hey, has left the building. <laughs> we're all in it for Christ. That's the main thing. Yep, and that's the main thing, and that's the way we're going to keep it. We're going to keep him at the center of all, all that we do. So one last ask I have to ask you, please share this episode. If you see clips of this episode on social media, please share it around. Get the word out there of what God is doing through the life of Charlie as well as just the, the ministry as a whole of I Like Birds. And uh, you'll be blessed, and you'll be blessing somebody else along the way, and that's all and we can ask for. If they're interested in going into the prison ministry— here we go. Listen to this. And you want to go into the prison, you can either contact Zach at his ministry and ask for the information, or you can go to tdcj.texas.gov, scroll down to volunteer services, and you will find the application there yep. that you can fill in. And there's a training session online that you can take. That would be your first step to trying to go into the prison system. And, uh, I shared that with a person uh, this past Sunday, and he's already starting to do it. I shared that with Zach, and he went right on in there and got it done. Knocked so it out. That's the main thing you need to know. That's your first step on going in. Yep. So if you're interested in going in, do that. If you want to contact me to get more information on how to go in, Zach knows how to reach me. So just reach out to the <laughs> I Like Birds ministry, and yep. he will definitely know how to find me. Yep. I'll be the middleman, all right? I'll be the yeah, middleman. Yeah, he can send me a, a, a 
pigeon with a letter on it. Yep, absolutely. And if you want to check out Launchbox, go to their Instagram. They have great content. They're always posting up what they're doing on there. So make sure you check them out as well. So we're super grateful that you tuned in with us today. We really appreciate you being here. We hope this uh, episode uplifted your faith and you spiritually grew through it. And uh, you really got touched by the by the heart of Charlie coming on here and sharing the love of Jesus. So thank you so much. Don't forget, this is uh, I Like Birds, which means I like the Bible and I like words. So I like birds. We'll see you on the next one. Thank you so much.